meeting for May 22nd, 2019. Welcome everyone. If you would please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, board. And if I could ask uh, Trustee Banducci to read the mission statement. Since we're all talking about a, you know, an experienced group during executive session, let me get my grandpa glasses on to read it. <laughs> <laughs> mission statement. North Idaho College meets the diverse educational needs of students, employers, and the northern Idaho communities it serves through a commitment to student success, educational excellence, community engagement, and lifelong learning. Thank you. We do have a quorum, and we have several guests tonight, which I'm so pleased to see. My dear friend Judy and Steve Meyer are here. We're excited about that. Her whole crowd of friends are here, including former Senator Mary Lou Reed. Welcome. Um, so we will go on to the minutes. Are there any changes to the minutes? Hearing none. I will adopt the minutes as written. We have no one signed up for public comment. And so we're going to start off with uh, celebrating success. Greg and Stanley, the Cardinal Central Enrollment Services Center. Yeah, right Thank you very much. Chair, Chair Wood, trustees, President McLennan, uh, colleagues and guests, thank you for this opportunity to introduce our celebration tonight. It said on your agenda that Peg Blake would be doing that. It's obvious I'm not. Peg, uh, Peg uh, would like to be here this evening but wasn't feeling well today, so I have the opportunity to step in. And it's truly an honor to introduce to you a familiar face you've heard from before, Dr. Teresa Bornpole. Uh, Teresa, the last time I, she spoke with you, I believe it was about the NIC Connect program where we were working with the high schools in Region 1 to take our services out uh, for those high school students transitioning to North Idaho College. Uh, in this last year, uh, Teresa was given a different assignment, and that is to be the, the manager of our Enrollment Services Center, Car Cardinal Central, that you're going to hear more about. I hope you had the opportunity, possibly, when we were uh, lining up for commencement over in Lee Kildow to get down there and see the center a bit. I suspect you'll see some pictures of it as well. But I really want to note, and I know uh, uh, th Teresa will, will share some of those names and some of the successes with you as well, but it's not only what you see on the front side of that center. Uh, in terms of what they provide to students in a one-stop shop where they can come and meet with our, uh, meet with our uh, ESAs, our enrollment Service. services associates, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but it's also the people that continue to work in the back offices that are really the, a lot of the strength behind that operation as well. So people you see up front, people you see in back, and the combination of those have provided a level of service for our students that's really phenomenal. We've improved dramatically uh, the services that we provide to prospective students coming in, continuing students, continuing on. So it's uh, with great pleasure and great pride that I introduce to you on behalf of Cardinal Central, Dr. Teresa Borenpol. I feel like we should applaud. <laughs> Hello, members of the board and President McLennan, as well as our distinguished guests. Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to be here to talk to you today about our new enrollment services initiative, Cardinal Central. Um, so if you remember, as Graydon just elaborated, I was here last time to talk to you about NIC Connect, which was a recruitment program where we went into Region 1 high schools to ensure that students had everything that they needed in the high school to go through the enrollment services program. Um, it was efficient, it was seamless, and it was designed with service excellence in mind for our students. And I'm very proud to tell you that we are doing the same thing for our current, current students at North Idaho College with Cardinal Central, making their process seamless, efficient, and designed for service excellence. So Cardinal Central is a one-stop service center where students can navigate the enrollment process and tend to the business of being a student. We have combined the point of contact functions for the admissions office, financial aid, registrar, and student finance into a one convenient location for students. So if you had entered Lee Kildow Hall before March of 2019, you would have found um, three enrollment services offices that had uh, windows that opened up to the hallway and one area where students would have to open a door to go into a service area. 
Um, when students were unsure about where they were going, that obviously made the possibility that students wouldn't come to the office at all. Or if a student stopped by one of those offices and found out that they had to go to another office, we gave them the possibility of walking to their car instead of walking to the next service area. So that's why it's so important to have this service area. Um, when I'm actually going to show you a quick photo of what that serv those service areas looked like. So this is actually a photo of the student finance window, and I took this photo today. So during that time, it looked a little more student friendly. There were pamphlets out and there was stuff on the wall, but a student would stand here in the hallway to talk about maybe a balance that they had on their account or setting up a payment plan, which might be something that you would want to do with a little bit more privacy. So for 10 years, Enrollment Services at NIC has dreamed of moving toward a one-step function. And with the hiring of Dr. Peg Blake, with uh, the Cardinal Central Initiative as one of her specific charges, we have done just that. So I'd like to instead welcome you to Cardinal Central, our new Student Services Center. This is our lobby. And this space was formerly the registrar's office, so if you haven't been, if you haven't been in Lee Kildall for a while, this is room 116, just on the, by the south entrance. And we took out the hallway interface, as you can see, so that students could come into the space and allow them to feel a little bit more engaged with the process. So another view of Cardinal Central. So Cardinal Central is staffed by Enrollment Services Associates, or ESAs, and these team members have gone through over eight months of training at this point. Really, really impressive folks. And they are trained to help with approximately 80% of the issues with admissions, financial aid, student finance, and the registrar's functions. And each team member is actually trained on all four areas. So if a student comes in and they need to talk about financial aid, they're not waiting for the financial aid window to open up. Anybody can assist them, which is a fantastic opportunity. So like I said, our goal is to complete 80% of the functions in that front space, but there is some stuff that they just need to have elevated to our specialists in the home office. However, we don't send the student to the home office, we have the home office come to the student. So once again, we're not giving students that opportunity to walk to their car instead of getting assistance with that office. We're actually bringing our associates from the home offices up to the front to assist. <coughs> So this is a little bit dark. This is actually a video I'm going to show you in just a second um, because I want to tell you a little bit about some of the experiences that we have for students. So it's really important that students feel like they are a part of their process and they feel like their time is being respected. And so we have um, invested in a software called QList. And QList allows us to develop virtual lines for service instead of having students queue physically. So instead of having to see a line snaking down the hallway, students actually get to check in. They can either check in from home before they arrive or when they get to our center they can check in at the kiosk by typing in their name it puts their um, their information up on a board and as soon as it's time for them to come to the front of the office there's a bell that rings and it calls their name up which is kind of cool because they can sit down and relax while they're waiting we have USB chargers on the wall they can charge their cell phones this is especially handy let's say during the beginning of the school year when our lines are probably going to be 15 20 minutes long students can check in go grab a coffee and then come back on time to go up to meet their person at the front. So this is just a point of view. So the students, excuse me, would pop in, they would type in their information. <coughs> I embarrassingly misspelled my last name with a correction here. <laughs> And then they could provide us their student ID and their date of birth so we can look them up. And then there's a list of options there. I'm going to click that I'm just here to ask a question. And then I can go sit down in the furniture. But with this video, I show you quickly that my name now appears on the board. And as soon as the person is ready to greet me, all of a sudden there's a ding and it says now serving Teresa at station four. So then I can go over to station four and meet with my enrollment services associate. So it respects our students' time um, and it also makes it so that as an enrollment services associate, I can finish the work I was doing with the student before, before I call up another student. So another important function is the computer bay. If a student comes to us and says, hey, I'd really like to apply, or I need assistance with my financial aid application, it doesn't make sense, um, we want to help them in the moment. So we actually walk them over to these computers and assist with whatever function it is that they need help with so that they don't leave without something being accomplished. Um, these computers were actually granted to the financial aid office through the NIC Foundation, and they gifted them then to us to be able to provide service in Cardinal Central. So it's kind of fun to see 
see that gift from the NIC Foundation go from that one uh, small office to a larger office with a little bit more use for all students. And then finally, a huge piece of this office is, once again, this is our front area. You can see a little door there in the back. That is where our, our enrollment services associates have their desks. And when we are at the front office, we try to do everything uninterrupted. When we're working one-on-one -on -one with the student, we don't want to be answering the phone. We don't want to be answering emails. We want to be present with the student. But behind that door, you will find the phone is ringing, emails are being answered, documents are being processed. Um, all in real time. And so our team is housed back there if they're not up in the front, working feverishly to make sure that students that aren't face-to-face -face are still getting that same fantastic service. So as Graydon noted, this would be impossible without a huge amount of partners from across campus. Um, specifically, the enrollment services team has really congealed around this huge project. We've been working on this for about 18 months now. Um, specifically, the leadership of Tammy Haft and Stephanie House, um, Ellen Crabtree, Jessica Grantham, huge in helping us shape what this was going to look like for this, the customer service that was now coming into our space um, as opposed to being in those individual offices. We could not have done this without IT. We could not have done this without facilities, without our marketing team, without our campus leadership. It's been a huge push, a huge pull, and we are so proud to now have been open for just about nine weeks. So please feel free to come visit us. You can drop by unannounced, just pop in or check into QList and let us know you're coming. <laughs> Thank you so much, board. Questions about this, D Trustee Banducci? And I'll ask you to forgive my ignorance. I'm not, um, no, that's not how I want to ask it. How does this integrate with the new joint use facility, or, or how do they work together? I'm, I'm not sure I understand where the handoff is or how that works exactly. Yeah, so, um, so there's a fair amount of history there. When we had first started talking about the Enrollment Services Center, and that goes back to that 10-year time frame, we thought about having this specific center over in the Joint Use Facility. And that took on a little bit of a different vision, and it's, it's, it's much more about that transfer piece. So we're still working on some um, of the larger pieces about the possibility of housing an ESA over in the Joint Use Building that actually rotates among our team as well, so that we have those services at the very front of our campus, but we can also talk to students about what it means to transfer amongst the NIHE institutions. Um, and the great thing about that is since we, if, if that's what ultimately happens, that's kind of what we're exploring right now, then when we're trained up on the NIHE transfer uh, information from the joint use, we're also talking about that here in Lee Kildow Hall with our students that we're interacting with. So it's not the same vision that we had 10 years ago, but I've been in, in multiple meetings and we're working on some um, service level agreements to see what we can work out to have one of our team members over there delivering that same service at the front of the campus. Thank you. Great. Of course. Trustee Howard. Um, you know, <clears throat> enrollment can be a very intimidating thing for some folks. Uh, it's confusing sometimes and it's obviously time consuming. Uh, so this is a great program. Uh, but one of our huge big growth areas is dual credits and I guess I would like you to see if you could uh, uh, describe for me to the extent to which you're involved in helping the dual credit students coordinate their schedules with the high schools which gets to be a problem and if you're not doing it yet is there a plan going forward to try and address that issue yeah, we work really closely with dual credit. We did stop short of putting dual credits functions within Cardinal Central, but dual credit is just up the hallway from us, so we work with them a ton. I had five students today from a North Idaho high school um, applying for their dual credit applications in our office this afternoon. So we work with it a ton. Um, we process all of their paperwork in our home office, and then when students call and want information about the process, we help them. One thing that we stop short of is providing advising information for either dual credit students or really general um, population population students because we don't want to interfere with that relationship between the student and their advisor. Um, so we work with them a lot process-wise. When it comes to which classes to take, we leave that up to our trusted uh, dual credit team and we definitely keep in close contact with them. Good. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Well, it's a wonderful presentation. We got to see just the outside of it when we were lined up for graduation and it's, um, it looks spectacular. I'd love to go over and see it in person. You're always so I'll, welcome. I'll work on that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great work. Well, board, we have a very big crowd tonight, and I think they're here to listen to us talk about policy. I'm not certain they want to drag on for hours on policy. 
but we do have an agenda item that um, we might want to move up. Trustee Howard. Yes, um, Madam Chair, I would like to make a motion um, with regard to tab one, um, the second reading of the emeritus status, the nomination of Judy Meyer. Um, I really wanted to make a motion to put that at the end of the agenda so everybody <laughs> stuck around. But I was outvoted. So I would like to uh, make a motion to move that up to the next item on the agenda. Yes, she still has friends on this board, <laughs> yes. Um, all right, you have a motion. Do we have a second to second. move that? Second by Joe. All in favor? Aye. 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 So we will move that up. Um, it's our next order of business. Now, after this emeritus status presentation, there will be a short reception. President, where is that going to be held? Sh Shannon, where is that going? <laughs> right across the hall. So we would ask all of you to take a few minutes and join us at a short reception, and then we'll reconvene the board meeting. <clears throat> so with that, uh, Trustee Howard, would you like to begin on the second reading of emeritus status for our nomination for Judy Meyer? Yes. Do we have a motion pending? I don't think so. Well, then, I better start let me with start that. by making a motion. Yeah. <laughs> that um, that we grant to uh, Judith Sotomayor uh, the status of emeritus, um, and at, in that status as the first emeritus uh, trustee uh, for North Idaho College. I'd second that. Second. All right, you second that. Uh, all in favor? Well. Oh, well, dis go ahead, discussion. under discussion, thank you. I'm too excited about this, <laughs> to do it right. Um, do you want me to read this first? I would like you to read that, right. thank you. There, are, um, Judy's been around for a long time at <laughs> NIC. <laughs> And uh, the Maybe list I is, don't want you to read it. Yeah, right. <laughs> but um, I, I think that we all ought to recognize that not only has she served NIC, but she served the state in many capacities. She's on the State Board of Education, and she was president of the State Board of Education. She's been in community service with Blue Cross Board and Hospice, the Regional Library, and Public TV. Uh, she's been recognized by two University President Medallion Awards for Education Excellence and has been involved as a successful business owner and operator with her husband uh, for 37 years in this community. Um, she served a total of 22 years with NIC. I mean, let that sink in for just a moment. Uh, 22 years she served this uh, institution. <laughs> Thank you. Um, through that 22 years, she's helped manage uh, balanced board um, budgets and uh, at a time when we were having a 46% enrollment increase, uh, dealing with budget problems, uh, helped to, uh, develop uh, the dual credit program that is growing by leaps and bounds, quite frankly, with regard to local high school students getting uh, uh, associate's degrees sometimes before they get their high school diplomas. Uh, selected, uh, helped select three different presidents uh, and has been involved in the development of professional technical education, supported the KTech project, and uh, continued to produce, uh, help produce uh, athletic teams uh, with additional funds. Um, she was intimately involved in the development of the new uh, Health and Science Building, which coincidentally is called the Meyer Health and Science Building. And as uh, she and her husband have contributed to that, Steve, um, the, um, she strengthened partnerships that the NIC has with uh, Lewis Clark uh, Community College or State College and with the U of I and was involved in purchasing and development of the education corridor which um, is growing every year. Um, she's been in a help us be in a close relationship with Kootenai Health with, through, with our educational programs and helped us get a $3 million grant to start a new aerospace industry training program, as well as being intimately involved in the development of a Parker Technical Education Center. Um, so Judy has been involved in so many things and has been such a big part of NIC that um, it is our great pleasure, I think, to um, have her be the first um, first nominee, and now uh, after this motion, um, the, the first emeritus uh, trustee for NIC. Thank you. And after 
after we vote on the motion, I would I will ask her to come forward and then you can read the resolution. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Judy, would you come forward? You can bring your wonderful husband if you'd like and come up to the He's gonna stay. If you would come right up there. <laughs> right up here? Right there. Look into the camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we will continue. Oh, no. It's going to be a while. <laughs> right. you, you want me to read the resolution now? Yeah. All right. Resolution of the Board of Trustees of North Idaho College, Kootenai County, Idaho, to approve and bestow the designation of trustee emeritus upon Judith Santa Meyer. Whereas the North Idaho College Board of Trustees, pursuant to North Idaho College Policy 2.01.09, may confer trustee emeritus status and privileges therein to exceptional former North Idaho College trustees in recognition of their contributions to the institution. And whereas there has been presented to the board criteria for nomination of Judith Santa Meyer, and whereas Ms. Meyer's dedicated service as a fiscal steward for North Idaho College has been demonstrated as follows. Effective management of annual budget balance budgets through an era of 46% enrollment increases, purchase of the former Stimson Mill site for future college expansion, and designation of a capital improvement reserve fund that enabled the construction of the Parker Technical Education Center and expansion of the delivery of career technical education programs. And whereas the board desires to recognize Ms. Meyer's tireless efforts in the areas of educational excellence and student success as demonstrated by the following. Development of a popular dual credit education program with local high schools, the growth and improvement of computer-based learning, and a $3 million federal grant to establish an aerospace education program. Whereas Ms. Meyer has demonstrated her high regard for our community in the following manner. Her strong support for the local high school district's creation of the Kootenai Technical Education Campus. Her close relationship with Kootenai Health and partnership in support of expanded health care education programs and strengthened educational collaboration with Lewis Clark State College and the University of Idaho. And whereas Ms. Meyer's 22 years of service on the North Idaho College Board of Trustees are marked with a distinction, a passion for creating meaningful educational pathways for all learners, and an unwavering commitment to help North Idaho College achieve its highest potential. Be it resolved by the board as follows. Judith Sentemeyer is des designated trustee emeritus of the North Idaho College Board of Trustees. The chair of the board is hereby authorized to execute, and the secretary of the board is hereby authorized to attest this resolution. This resolution shall be in full force and effect and immediately upon adoption passed and adopted by the Board of Trustees of North Idaho College, Kootenai County, Idaho, this 22nd day of May, 2019. Judy, yes. Hello, Judy. We would love to hear from you, Ms. Meyer. Well, thank you. There's not much I can say except none of this would happen without the support of all of you. Uh, thank you for recognizing me. But it's more importantly that the professional folk who are here every day making it happen. My joy will be to continue to support education, but I don't have to go to the meetings. <laughs> <laughs> well, would you please come forward? We have a little something for you. Sec Mr. Secretary, or Ken, whoever. It says in there, Secretary, you had to do all the reading. Yes, right. <laughs> You can actually, if the whole board would gather in the front, and Judy, if you'd be in the center. This way, Judy. Let's go. This is what you. This is the. Yeah, this is what Ken just read. Thank you. I think part of my uh, favorite thought is one that we've talked about before. 
the Sufi blessing that says, from you I receive, to you I give, together we share, by this we give. Okay, let's go have it. Thank you. Welcome back from the reception for Judy Meyer. Now we have get down to business. That was the fun stuff. So the first thing we'll do is our constituent reports. Asnick, Paul McLeod. Paul, this is your first meeting. Welcome. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, President McClendon, and guests. It's, uh, it's wonderful be, to be here. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak before you today. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be here representing the students of NIC. And um, I have had the opportunity to get to know the new ASNIC team, and I am, uh, I'm incredibly excited. Um, I, I have great faith that this team is going to accomplish a lot of great things, and I'm looking forward to standing in front of you and telling you all about those great things. Um, I'm ex incredibly excited about this year and the incredible opportunity that we have. In the past month, the new ASNIC team has had the annual training day. This gave the new ASNIC team the opportunity to get to know one another and talk about our goals and ideas for the fall and spring. In an effort to give dual enrollment students a voice on campus, we have gone through the process of hiring a new dual enrollment representative. We inter interviewed several candidates and have selected Abby Stilkey for this position. With our dual enrollment population growing, we saw this position as essential um, for having a, uh, adequate representation for all students at NIC. Uh, and in addition to hiring a dual enrollment representative, we have also began hiring for the Student Events Board. Uh, we hope to have at least one or two students begin uh, during the summer to start preparing for our, our, uh, our events that will be right at the beginning of the year in the fall, like the Day of Welcome. Um, the previous ASNIC team wrote up a resolution regarding the in-district tuition, and if it's all right with you, I'd like to read that for you today. Would that be all right? Certainly. Great. Thank you. Whereas tuition has been on a consistent rise because of multiple increases in district tuition over the past few years, whereas tuition serves as a large barrier that keeps students from attending North Idaho College, whereas NIC has been conservative with not increasing taxes over the years, whereas the college focus is on retention and recruitment, not raising tuition, is sending a clear and strong message to students that we want them at NIC. Therefore, be it resolved by the associated students of North Idaho College that we do not support the increase in industry tuition, but instead support the increase of the tax rate. And that's all I have for you. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak for you today. All right. Trustees, any questions for Paul and the resolution? No, it was a great, resolu great resolution that you read to us. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, thank you, Paul. Staff Assembly, Kathy Sparks. Good evening, Chairwood, trustees, and President McClellan. Staff Assembly had a short meeting in May. Um, we handed out uh, nomination um, certificates to each uh, staff assembly member that had been nominated for the staff excellent awards, and there were 17 people that received nominations, so that was pretty cool. Um, we also had uh, an electronic election, and so our new officers, um, Tom Green will be replacing me as chair, and I'd like to introduce to you to Jeff Davis. He is the new vice chair. And we have Sarah Martin, who will be the secretary, and our new senators are Liz Atkinson, Steve Kurtz, Angie Rios, Heidi Schrader, Alethea Carpenter, and Claire Hansinger. 
We also received a report uh, from President McClellan, and we also received a report from Melissa Mawini from Meet and Confer. And that was our meeting. Great. Board, any questions for Kathy? Thank well, you. Thank, thank you. you. And Jeff, thank you for coming to the board meeting. <clears throat> what? And you came to the board meeting. Did you get some cake, I hope? <laughs> 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 Happy birthday. Jeff, they missed me singing to you earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Faculty Assembly, Joe Jacoby. Good evening, Chair Wood, trustees, President McLennan, honored guests. Thanks for the opportunity to share what we've been doing this month. Uh, our first order of business was holding elections, so our new uh, Faculty Assembly Chair is going to be Chris Pelchat who is fairly new to NIC, but I'm really excited. He's been uh, coming up with a lot of fun ideas and been a big help in a lot of areas. I think we're gonna have a really good experience. So, uh, And then I get to uh, not have to skip rehearsals and things like that. So, But it has been a lot of fun getting to come and see you all every month. And trying to compete with Graydon, of course, in the Thai department. And tonight, I think I won by default. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brian Hannaford is going to continue as vice chair of faculty assembly and in our wisdom uh, Gerard Mathis was absent during the meeting so he was nominated secretary treasurer and he was unable to actually fulfill those duties so we're still in the process of um, <laughs> figuring that part out but that will be figured out by fall. Uh, Chris Martin came and gave us a report on the 360 evaluations, which was quite helpful. Thank you for your time, Chris. Uh, and then we had uh, a resolution ourselves uh, that was, I'm going to be having to paraphrase this just a little bit, but we wanted to have a resolution to the effect that uh, we support the meet and confer policy. It's an integral part of shared government governance and that we value the meet and confer committee's inclusion in the budget process. Uh, and that came about simply because there was a, a submission by meet and confer and then we didn't hear back from uh, a, 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 in a very timely manner. Uh, and nobody was terribly thinking anything nefarious was going on, but just wanted to say, well, we want to, uh, we understand that this was kind of an unusual budget year because you had such clear direction from the state, <laughs> both of them. <laughs> so, uh, but we felt like this is an, an important issue in, in terms of shared governance, so we wanted to share that resolution with you. And that was the end of our meeting. Do you have any questions for us? Board, any questions of Joe? Well, it's been a pleasure, Joe. Thank and you. Kathy, this is your last meeting too? Oh my gosh, well, it's been very nice to work with both of you. I'm sure you'll just come to the board meetings for fun, right? You know, it <laughs> is, uh, yes. Okay, yeah. and Chris, yeah. thank you for coming, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you to, so great much to for have. this opportunity and really I, I very much appreciated you this year. So Thanks. Thanks. And Senate, is it Ben Tishida? Did I do that right? I'm afraid not, Madam oh, Chair. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I can gracefully say that you are the, in a long list of people who have failed. <laughs> uh, you are not the first by any means, and you have consistently hit it incorrectly. Uh, it is Tashida is the correct okay. uh, pronunciation. So, All right. uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair and members of the board, uh, Senate met uh, last week. Uh, we held elections as well. Uh, I am the new chair uh, taking over for Jessica Adams. Uh, we thank, thank her for her wonderful service uh, this last year. She did an amazing job. I hope I can uh, fill her shoes well. Uh, we also uh, elected Leonard Lambert as our vice chair, Gerard Mathis as parliamentarian, and Lisa Kellerman as our recording secretary. Uh, after that, uh, we had two uh, two policies that we had for a second reading that we did pass. That was the copyright and intellectual property policies and procedures. Uh, those are now forwarded on to the president uh, for further review. Uh, and then we also had the initiation of policy policy uh, that you'll hear more about from uh, uh, Jessica, later, uh, that was, uh, there were two updates uh, from the president and the president's cabinet that we uh, accepted. So that was our meeting.
Great. Board, any questions for Mr. Tushida? <laughs> Led, well, thank you so much. And Jessica, thank, thank you. you for your service as well. OK. That takes us to our president's report, Dr. McLennan. I just have a brief uh, report this evening. I want to add my appreciation again for the constituents leaders uh, who served this year and welcome uh, the new crew in. Uh, I think uh, everybody's going to be well served and I look forward to uh, keeping the communication lines open and, uh, and working together to fulfill the mission of the college. Uh, I want to I also extend my appreciation to everybody, uh, especially the Board of Trustees, for their participation in last week's commencement ceremony. Uh, we had a lot of people there. Uh, and I think it's probably one of the largest cohorts of students going through graduation that we've seen in, in some time. Uh, I have received, uh, different than in prior years, I've received unsolicited thanks and appreciation and congratulations from community members who either saw a video of it or were in the, in the audience uh, watching it, students who participated. Um, I, I, one of the consistent um, messages is how, uh, I hesitate, to, no, I'm not gonna hesitate to say this, how wonderful our speakers were. Uh, they just did a terrific job. Uh, and I gave Graydon a hard time leading into this about the length of his comments, and I was actually wanting 30 minutes more. So, just, uh, but but it was just a great day. The rain, you know, did uh, kind of overcast a little bit, but um, it was just just a. It kind of brings home and reminds me again every year I go through it, uh, the sheer joy of watching each graduate come across the stage, and you could just see the the sense of accomplishment, um, emotion on their, on their faces as they came through. It was very, very gratifying. And so thank you all for being a part of that and getting to experience that. And that was the last in a line of uh, pretty special events throughout the, the celebration uh, phase of our academic year, you know, starting with GED uh, graduation, which some of you were able to to uh, join us for the ADN uh, pinning ceremony, the dual credit uh, uh, family breakfast, uh, and all of the, the uh, employee appreciation and awards uh, breakfast that uh, preceded commencement. Uh, we do a pretty good job, I think, of helping all of our uh, members of our community uh, be celebrated along the way to their achievement. And um, it's just so wonderful to see all those accomplishments. Um, <clears throat> speaking of accomplishments, you may have read in the paper and probably already know that we took the women's softball championship for the NWAC uh, again this year. That We did that last year. We did it again this year. It's a lot of fun to watch that. Our men's golf uh, also, they're a three-peat. They, this is the third year in a row that they've won. So that makes three championship uh, athletic uh, teams when you add our men's basketball team uh, this year. They need a round of applause for that. That's amazing. And then lastly, I just mentioned, I sent a note out, uh, Shannon did, I believe, on the I-90 Corridor Aerospace Expo that is being hosted in Coeur d'Alene at the resort uh, next week. I, uh, their opening reception, I think, is Tuesday evening. Uh, Trustee Dunlap, I know you're planning to come, but I just want to make sure the board knows Hi. that you're, okay, great, that you're invited to be there for, for that. And, uh, you know, that event is... Uh, uh, really grown uh, the the number of participants uh, and we share that with Spokane and and our role in the aerospace industry is really highlighted at that one of the neat things that's going to happen there uh, you you're aware that we received a special grant there were only 10 in the country from uh, the all in her hounds hands foundation which is the foundation for the band Metallica oh, yeah. and the basis of that uh, that award was for the machining manufacturing aspect of our aerospace program primarily and so the uh, the lead for uh, the Metallica grant nationally is coming because um, coming to the aero the, uh, to the conference uh, because I, I said there's only 10 of them in the country but interestingly two of them are located in the inland Northwest Community Colleges of Spokane and North Idaho College were two of the recipients uh, for that grant and so they're going to uh, come and we're going to showcase some of that uh, at the conference as well so look forward to that you certainly are invited and I know that you can touch base with Shannon if you need more information about that.
That concludes my report. Questions for Dr. McLennan. Um, Trustee Dunlap, I think you had your hand in some of that aerospace stuff at both colleges. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna, it'll be fun to go to that with you. Well, under your report, you did not mention one thing that I wanted to make sure you knew about tonight. Um, uh, Mayor Steve Woodmire was going to come tonight on, under public comment and issue you high praise for the tour that you gave of the uh, North Idaho mayors of the Parker Technical Center. He was so pleased with that, all of them were. I know you got a, a lot of feedback from that tour. They were all enthralled with it and um, you bought them lunch, that always makes them happy. And so he wanted to come, but he's, he's judging some senior projects tonight. But he wanted to be sure that you knew that he was just so grateful and he's just uh, heaps a lot of praise on you and your performance here. Well, I sincerely appreciate that. What, I, what really um, it afforded us was an opportunity to get in front of the Region 1 uh, mayors uh, of which I had, I really, and I'm ashamed to admit that I didn't really realize how many mayors there were. And these are a lot of folks that in really small communities um, <clears throat> gave, uh, before the tour, had about 45 minutes to share and answer questions about the role of North Idaho College in our region. And it was such a wonderful connection to have all of these elected officials. They were interested. They wanted to know more. And uh, we've made a commitment to connect with each of them with our leadership team to find out ways that we can look at serving their communities, make sure they understand, you know, there was some uh, interest in, well, how do we get Parker Technical Education in my community? And, you know, we talked through some of the... <laughs> That's not a tax some of the Some of the constraints <laughs> yeah. there. But, you know, there are some things that we can do, but it was just a great uh, information exchange and uh, it was a great opportunity and, and it worked out very well. So thank you. Great. Wonderful. Okay. That takes us on to our Meyer Health Science expansion, expansion update, and I'm gonna ask Chris Martin to, to do that tonight. Madam Chair, members of the board, just a quick update on the Meyer Health Science expansion project. This is moving forward uh, really, really well. We've completed the initial programming. This included um, many, many program faculty from the Natural Sciences Division, as well as leadership from that division, as well as some program leaders from Health Sciences. So the programming is complete and we're moving into schematic design. So there are four sessions planned over the summer where we'll sit down again and meet with um, each of those faculty members and, and the division chairs and develop the schematic designs to drive the building so that when faculty come back in the fall, we can start the process of making sure that we heard them correctly through the programming that we've captured all of their needs. The other things that are happening at this point in time are a full review of the existing drawings of Meyer Health Science so that we can uh, connect the new facility um, as well as we possibly can. And again, find the efficiencies that we, we had planned on with the mechanical strength that's already built into that building. So that's what's happening right now. Uh, in the next few weeks, you'll see geotech, um, some surveys, and again, a thing that we're really worried about right now and focused on is there's a lot of utilities in the corridor between the sub and Meyer Health Science, so we'll be working with our utility partners just to make sure that we're aware of where, where those are as we continue moving forward. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Chris? Yeah, Trustee Howard. Uh, probably more being reminded of things that I've forgotten, uh, but could you uh, kind of bring us up to speed on where we are on the budget on that? I mean, w I know we approved a partial budget, but we didn't approve a final building budget, and where are we on the, the budget that we approved for the planning or whatever? So we, you are correct, uh, Trustee Howard, you approved the chance, uh, the opportunity for us to move into design for that facility. Um, we are still negotiating the final budget with ALSC. There were some questions about the lab consultants that have been brought in on this particular project, but we're almost there on finalizing um, that contract with ALSC. And at this point, all we're doing is um, the work around the geotech survey, the surveys, and then the programming piece. Uh, pending the final resolution of the contract with ALSC. So, so my, my recollection is, though, that we didn't budget or approve a specific amount for that investigation and the preliminary. Are you going to bring back to us a budget a proposal for the planning portion before we move to the construction portion? Ch Chair Wood, um, Trustee Howard, absolutely. So we're finalizing that right now with ALSC, and before we would be come forward for construction, we're bringing the plan, we're working with 
uh, Trustee Dunlap and Trustee Murray as the liaisons in that process as we get closer to what the actual price will be, making sure that we're in line before we bring the project budget back to the board. Thank you. Great. Other questions for Chris? Well, Chris, while you're on a roll, we can all notice the joint use building coming right along. Do you want to talk about that for a moment? Absolutely. That's a really um, exciting time, a real high point right now. So I did make a couple notes before um, the meeting this, this afternoon because we are almost there. And so currently right now we are on schedule for substantial completion on May 31st. Wow. Furniture is being delivered on June 1st. And we have a date for punch list of June 6th. And so this is coming together really, really quickly. You'll notice that the parking lot project is complete minus the striping. Uh, the landscape is going in at this moment. The glass doors were put in today. That was the final glass element that was needed. And so um, that is happening really, really quickly. And the sod will be going in hopefully before the first day of June. Wow, very nice. OK, thank you. I'm sure. oh. Trustee uh, <clears throat> Could we, uh, as the trustees, uh, have a tour of that building uh, sometime in the near future? <clears throat> do I do something before we, the next board meeting? We, we can certainly arrange that. Um, the, I haven't, yeah. I've missed every tour that we've taken through there, so I would like to join you on that. <laughs> I haven't been myself, so. <laughs> so. All right. Chris, is it okay if we go in there? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're almost in there where you can go in without a hard hat. We're getting really, really close. Um, we're happy to set that up and I'll work with uh, Dr. McLennan's office and we'll get that scheduled um, both individually or a, as a group. We're happy to make, make that tour happen. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, that takes us, we've done tab one. We're going to go to tab two. Second reading, our general fund budget for FY20. Chris Martin. <clears throat> Madam Chair, members of the board, thank you for this opportunity tonight to come before you with the second reading of the FY 2020 uh, budget for the college. Uh, just a couple of, of quick comments, if I may, just to set the stage. We talked about this last month, but a couple of key points to remember. Uh, the planning assumptions for this budget included flat enrollment growth for our traditional four credit students going in the next fiscal year with a planned increase in dual enrollment of 5% enrollment increase year over year. Um, we talked briefly last month about the changes in state funding and how that impacted the college and that there was an overall net decrease in state funding year over year. The budget that was presented at the last meeting also proposed a 1% uh, tax levy increase and a $2.50 <coughs> per credit increase for in-district and a $3.50 increase for non-district. And that really brings us uh, to the discussion tonight. Um, the board requested that we present several scenarios um, when we came back. So I'd just like to walk through those briefly and then open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is actually on page two of your packet. Um, the scenarios that we were asked to present included the removal of in-district tuition, an additional half percent increase to base um, salary for employees, a 2% increase to part-time faculty and staff, and a reduction, or excuse me, an addition of 1% to the property tax levy in exchange for the tuition. happy to walk through any of the impacts here and have uh, further conversation but at this point we'd be happy to stand for questions um, well there are a lot of different scenarios here and I know we all have uh, different ideas in mind maybe we're similar in some I don't know if there's a motion to start us off for discussion um, yeah I, I think we need to make a motion on the overall budget okay. the second, and then any amendments all right. so I would make a motion that uh, we approve the uh, fiscal 2020 institutional budget. 
I have a motion. Do I have a second? <laughs> I'll second it. Discussion? Okay. Now I would like to make a motion to amend the proposed budget to uh, remove the in-district tuition increase of uh, 250 per credit hour and um, re replace that revenue with a 1% property tax increase. Second. Okay. I'll have a motion and a second. Discussion? <laughs> so I'd like to discuss that. <laughs> uh, so you, uh, you've chosen just option A and then the, an additional 1%, which no. is no, so it would be a total of 2%. Yeah, my understanding is that if we, and I could be stand corrected, but if we remove the in-district tuition increase of 250 per credit hour, that that could essentially be uh, replaced uh, from an income standpoint with a 1% tax increase, property tax increase. Is that correct? correct. All right. So and I'm just, my motion is to offset the tuition, removing the tuition increase with a 1% property tax. But that would be a total of a 2%. Mm -hmm. Because the 1% is already built into the budget proposal. Yeah, correct. Okay. All right. Well, so I want to talk to you about that. So mm -hmm. I want to just talk with you a little bit about that. So um, the in-district tuition increase, what is your philosophy behind that? Well, I kind of support the students' uh, resolution uh, that was presented to us tonight. But I think based historically on the fact that we have, um, over the last four or five years, essentially um, raised tuition almost every year. And we have not raised, we've been pretty good stewards, I think, of our responsibilities to the community in terms of not raising um, property taxes. And if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, um, those property taxes that we have not taken which could fall into the, um, the, the category of, of the, the foregone taxes, I guess. Uh, we have a, the largest uh, pool of foregone taxes, of the, I think, of any agency in the county, yeah. um, which, which just illustrates the fact that we have been pretty good stewards of our responsibilities to the community. And so putting a 1% tax increase this year to help the students out with uh, their educational expenses, I think, would be an appropriate balance um, that uh, we, we should maintain between property taxes and tuition. Okay. So um, what I recall, and Chris, you can help us with this, there was a five-year span where we didn't take any increase, and then I think the last two years we did a 1%? We did a 1% in, in FY18. Okay. We did not do one last year. Okay. Um, so we have been really mindful of increasing taxes, um, and you did give us the breakout here that uh, an additional 1%, I think it's $2.86 a year, to a homeowner with that has a four hundred thousand dollar home, so that's kind of a higher end home too. Okay. So, um, oh, thank you. So I don't disagree with um, assisting the students if we can, because every year we have said we we want them to definitely have a piece of the pie that this is we have to share the burden but i think they have consistently and so maybe this is the year to uh to not give them that additional burden the other thing though ken <clears throat> that i would like to see um you left out the half percent increase to the base i'm interested in that because we don't exactly um have any other mechanism to keep us from falling behind in the market and a half a percent to the base is very small. Um, most entities are doing, you know, one and two percent to the base on top of a step increase. And so, I, if we're not able to do much, at least want something. And uh, what I would propose, the two percent increase to part-time faculty and staff. I know that was Trustee Banducci's proposal, but what I would say about that um, with our adjunct, as much as we value them, we did give a raise last year, and um, the feeling from the administration that I've talked to is that we're probably at market. And so, uh, says we did a 2% last year, I don't think that we need to do another one this year, but what I'd like to do is propose we spend about for probably 40,000, 45,000 in lieu of this, um, and we do a salary study like we've committed to in policy. Last year we set it aside. 
And um, so if we took those funds this year, built that in instead of um, doing that 2% raise to adjunct, then we would have we would include them in the salary study. And next year at this time, we'd have a better idea of where, where we're at. So those are my counter arguments. Well, my, my motion to amend was just with regard to the tuition increase, increase and and um, offsetting it with a 1% yeah. property tax. I, I expected, quite frankly, we would go to the other elements after we dealt with that. So we, we got each one that we deal with separately. Oh. So. Okay. So my motion is basically to increase or to remove the tuition increase of $2.50 per credit hour and increase the property tax by 1% in order to offset it. Okay. We have a motion and seconding more discussion, trustees? Hi. Trustee Banducci? Well, if we're taking this one at a time, um, I support the removal of the in-district tuition increase. Um, I guess we're not talking about the base issue yet. We're not talking about the part-time faculty and part-time staff yet, I'm guessing. And so, but I do oppose the tax increase. I just want to be clear when I can talk to which. So this is just tax increase and just in tuition to in, di in district tuition, correct? That's all we're addressing at this moment. Correct. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I, I guess that's my comment. I, I, I would not like to see taxes increased. Do you have a different proposal on how to pay for the removal of the district in district tuition increase? of our existing funds, to be honest. And even worse, I, I did promote, again, I've carried this, carried the water for this for years. I know, like I say, Joe can attest to, because he's commented back to me several times over the years about the part-time and the, so, and the adjunct. So I'd actually probably increase our bill a little bit even. I think we have the funds. I, we're in a essential no growth environment with our enrollment. We may be down, we may be static, maybe we may be somewhat positive. We've, we're, we're poaching our future a little bit with the dual enrollment increases because it doesn't, it pays us a fraction of the amount, especially with our the model, the paradigm that we exist under where we try to put as many, you know, guys, people in the seats here on campus, you know, and we're trying to move more of that from remote. So I just find it hard to justify that we're, we're raising taxes or tuition at this time. I think we've got to just tighten our belts and live within our, our means and our budget. That's just so my opinion. So the budget, uh, as you've got in front of you, the only way to pay for what you're suggesting would be that we fund it out of our fund balance, which would be an ongoing thing every year, um, or we dip into our capital improvement fund, which we have set aside for capital improvement. So are you thinking about one of those? on how to fund this without a tax increase? I am, I am. I'd like to see the update on our balances. I know we've got a reserve, a substantial reserve, so I, I'm not opposed to, we tapped into it about four or 500,000, I believe, last year. And we, we did. We would be even less this year, but that might just be the short-term transitory price we pay for business, and we just may have to do that. I, yeah. Trustee Howard. Um, two things. One I forgot to mention, I suspect, is that one reason, another reason why I think we should relieve the students of the uh, tuition increase is uh, we should be reminded of the fact that they recently had an increase in fees because of the uh, student health center. So that those those um, essential expenses that they have every year have gone up quite considerably. With regard to taking it out, any. In any money out of the existing either capital improvement fund or reserve fund um, capital improvement fund i think we've we've made a proclamation anyway that we're going to reserve that for capital improvements and to start um, getting into that fund at this stage i think we'll just erode that commitment I, I would be opposed to that with regard to taking it out of the, the general fund um, we're predicting a flat enrollment this year 
there's a lot there's always some guesswork involved in enrollment increases or decreases and and that's kind of what that fund is for if if our projections on enrollment are wrong and it's if we still have a decrease then we're gonna have to get that money from someplace and we'll have to come out of the general fund because the budget will have been passed so I don't want to do that now I, I think the prudent thing is to <clears throat> if we remove the in-district tuition increase of 250 per credit hour we should find a way to pay for it right now and do that out of the uh, property tax increase of 1%. If I may. Yes, Trustee Benducci. With all due respect, Ken, I'm probably the last guy that that's a good argument to make to since I voted against the Student Recreation and Wellness Center because I knew that $100 was going to be on top of it. So they have to now say, oh, gosh, we got to do it this way because we just burdened the students with the extra 100 bucks, or they burdened themselves at the, at the encouragement of the staff, senior staff and a lot of folks. I'm the, guy, I'm the worst guy to make that case to because I go back and say we should have never built that in the first place. I think it's a boondoggle and that is an extra burden on the students and I think that reduces our flexibility regarding tuition and, and, and so we're right back to the argument I made a couple years ago before we voted to, uh, to build that thing and I did not support that. So now here we are and you just use that as the, part of the justification of why we can't do this. Well, that, that, tax, that burden shouldn't even be there in my opinion. So. so I'm confused. You just said that you don't want to increase the student in in I don't at all. Okay. Um, but and I, I don't think we should put the extra hundred bucks on them either, uh, or themselves, or however you want to, however you want to say that came about. We'll just well, what I said at the time was keep in mind, students, that we wouldn't be able to take that into consideration when we're looking at your tuition. So we're we're all somewhere all over on this thing. Um, so, I would like to call a question on the amendment. I have a call for the question. I had a little more discussion. Oh, we'll go ahead. Okay. Um, I have a question for Chris. If we did not, if we took a 1%, which was proposed, um, and I'm sure it's somewhere here in this option, but you can say it faster than I can find it. <clears throat> if we did a, the 1% that you've proposed rather than a 2% and we did not increase in-district student tuition, what would be the amount that we would have to pull out of our reserve? $135,464. Thank you. And that is an ongoing cost, but last year we took about 500000 out of the reserve. That's correct. Right. Um, well, Trustee Howard, I think that we can accomplish both if we did look at our reserve fund, which is, um, it's not in peril at the moment. Um, that's a doable amount at 135. What are your thoughts on that? It's 135 that's gonna go on every year and we're not gonna, we're not gonna have, um, the income support from it from the the tax increase i think the way to support it is a one percent tax increase that goes with it this year well we're already getting more money because of the new construction see that's the thing we're already getting a windfall because of the new construction which is increasing there's so much more additional new construction i, mean, I don't know if chris can project that or what they're saying on, you know, it's the on here the, the new property tax on the rolls what was yeah because i mean i i live in post falls i mean I have, tr I, have, I have a lot of tradesmen that are clients of mine, contractors, plumbing contractors, general contractors, uh, HVAC. I mean, every single guy that I have that's in the trades right now is so busy. I mean, they're overwhelmed. Landscape, uh, you know, guys doing this, anyway, sprinklers, whatever. So we're going to keep getting more money, the way, at least the way the county is growing at the moment. So it's not static, so we will still be increasing. And we've already banked that increase in addition to asking for the tax increase. I think what always comes to mind with me is uh, when we talk about if we take a 1%, we take a 2%, it's a small amount of money over a year's time, $2.86 more than what people are paying now, which is fairly low. I think we're like $50, $60 a year for most people. But what I keep in mind is every other taxing entity is going through this right now. and so those two dollars add up a little bit when you put us all together and so um i'm trying to look for a reasonable solution i like the idea of uh, holding the students harmless this year 
but maybe we do it through our reserve fund instead of that additional 1%. I Christy, I do appreciate that you pointed out that it is additive. There's an aggregate amount of tax increase because there are multiple tax districts. I mean, if you went to the polls yesterday, there were water districts, there were highway districts, there was hospital district. There's all the districts and all the people that were being elected yesterday, and those are all taxing authorities within the county. Now, depending on where you live in the county, you didn't see everybody on your ballot, but you could still see those that were directly affecting you in, in, your, in your tax. A question I have for you, you said you talked to administration and talked to some folks. Talk to me a little more about that feedback regarding the, the, the part-time and adjunct faculty, because that's one I, I, I'd be willing to let go. Um, if, if you feel very strongly, if you sense that there's a strong feeling that we're where we need to be at this time this year, but I'll be honest, if we exclude them again next year, I will, I will raise the issue again, though, because I, 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 I don't want them to feel shortchanged or truthfully just unappreciated or unloved. I'm just going to say it that way. Well, I'll tell you what, since we're going to take these one at a time, I will absolutely come back to that. But we'll finish with Ken's motion. Okay. I know. I just wanted to throw that out there since it sounds yeah. like we're trying to negotiate a little bit here. Well, I think we are. Um, but I, he's called for the question. And so um, all in favor of, do you want to repeat your motion, Ken? Yes. Removing the in-district tuition increase of 250 per hour per credit hour and so uh, replacing the net revenue, revenue stream with an increase of 1% local property tax. 1% in addition to the 1% proposed? Yeah, 1% is to offset the tuition. Okay, I get you. So it's a total of 2%. Yes. Okay. Ma uh, Madam Chair, if, yes. if I could, just so for clarification, just so I understand the motion, this is a motion to adopt the FY20 budget as proposed but with the changes to remove in-district tuition and to increase the tax levy by 1%. No, the motion, the motion to adopt the budget as proposed as a second, and my motion is an amendment to that. Okay. Uh, okay, Mark. So it seems like it's too compartmentalized, and how do we get back to wanting to address these other things in the budget if we pass that? You make a motion for an sure. amendment to the next item on the list. Well, we can do that, or, 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 again, just keep in mind that the Roberts Rules of Orders here that we're using here is by policy as a guideline. So if if the board can agree on on what their, or, or at least can articulate what they think is is going going to be something that is acceptable, then we need to eventually state one motion okay. to pass the budget as described, as you, as you all, at least a majority of you will agree to. With whatever amendments we pass in the meantime. True. I, 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 Ken, I don't know that you need to do the amendments. I mean, that, that, that's a way to do it. It's just it's, it's, it, it's sometimes difficult to follow from. Well, it just allows us to address there are like five different uh, amendments they all may not pass. And so I'm, I understand. I'm trying to do them in a way that we all have an understanding of what passes and what doesn't pass. Okay, so so what is up right now is is an amendment to the proposal. Just just we're only voting on the amendments for the uh, removal of the tuition. <coughs> Correct. And and the and an additional one percent property tax increase. Correct. Right. Yes. So all right, but we will do other amendments. I anticipate. Yeah. All right. So you've called for the question. Um, all in favor of that amendment? Aye. Aye. Nay? Nay. It passed. There's two to two? two. Three. Do we have three? Okay. All right. Motion approved. Um, so then I want to make a motion of, of an amendment to the budget. <laughs> to your amendment, right? No. no. To, the, to the budget. To the budget. Um, I would like to propose uh, the additional half a percent increase to the base, <clears throat> and I'd like to propose that in lieu of the 78,000 under option C, uh, we look at funding a salary study that we put into policy, and then next year at this time we'll have a really good um, data piece to look at when we look at salary. And I'd like the president to speak to uh, adjunct faculty and where they are in the market right now. You, I'm not sure I understand your motion. Okay. 
part of it was discussion. <laughs> uh, I'm making a motion to increase half percent <clears throat> to the base and on top of that, uh, fund a salary study. I'm going to say approximately $40,000 salary study. You want to do that separately just in case okay. one fails and one doesn't? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay. I make a motion for a half percent increase to the base. Do I have a second to my motion? I'll second it. Okay. Discussion? Trustee Dunlap. Um, <clears throat> Madam Chair, when you talk about a half increase to the base, is that in addition to uh, letter B, which already has a half a percent to the base as an option? Or are you just reiterating that singular half percent? Um, do you want to clarify that? So, Chris, you want to explain that first box because I think that's a little confusing. That, that half percent is not in the budget. Right. Okay. Correct. So what you see there is just a math formula of what's reductive for what would need to be added to the budget to cover that. So it's so So if you pulled out in A, if you pulled out, which we have in district tuition, we've got a hundred and thirty five thousand dollar cha challenge absent anything else. If you add an additional half percent increase to the base, you've got a hundred and thirty seven dollar challenge absent anything else. Now you've taken care of part of that with a 1% addition to the to the 2%, 2%. making a 2% yeah. total on the property tax. Um, and then you the, the, the math grows a little bit more if you add the 2% across the board increase to part-time faculty and part-time staff uh, at $78,000. Thank you. And yeah, and so all of that adds up to an amount, some of which has been partially taken care of by the additional 1% right. property tax. Right. Okay. Right. So um, what I want to do, like I said, is I don't want to erode that base so much that years down the road we're having to do a large increase just to be at market. I would like us to address it every year if we can, and I think this year we can, especially with that additional 1% that you all just passed. That's more than enough to cover the tuition. So any other questions on my motion? Well, we have a comment? Yes. All right, I've got a couple issues then, or comments. I uh, took the time to review this year. I've got the Your Employee Benefits 2019 that are effective July 1st, and I have the separate 2019-2020 Employee Benefits Rate Sheet here. So I can see the medical, I can see the dental, I can see the vision. I can see uh, on here, in addition to that, they've got the... Uh, life and accidental death and dismemberment with UNUM. They've got the voluntary life, long-term and short-term DI, the EAP, the AFLAC, which is supplemental. When I look at the I look at the benefits and then what we're talking about and the wages, salaries, um, I have two things jump out at me. And then part of this was actually some input from a couple of faculty. One is it's a very generous benefits package in addition to Percy and, and everything else. So we sometimes forget all the components of the compensation package. And I think with the 2% that we've got, I, I don't think we need the extra half percent to the base. Secondly, this is already a, a process that is a little bit skewed. If I have someone that's either under their wife's employee, employer's insurance, or I have somebody that maybe is retired from another line of work that has coverage or something like that, and say they don't exercise the ability to have health insurance, then that's a $1,200 benefit potentially for an employee plus one that they're not utilizing. So there's an imbalance there that some employees are being compensated more than others. And so why don't we have some sort of cafeteria plan or something that balances that out so that all employees are treated equally? You know, right now it's kind of a use or lose, and so you've got some employees that are being able to take full advantage of all this, and then others, because of their different circumstances, either can't or, or don't choose to because they don't need to. So there's a couple things about this, uh, just in the benefits anyway, about how maybe we can restructure it anyway to be more equitable across the board to all employees. And um, but then again, I don't support the half percent base increase either. Okay. So. Um, on the cafeteria plan, Todd, I think that's something we should look at it in the future. I know that other entities do have that to make it a little more equitable, so that's maybe something we can discuss in the future. Um, I would actually like to ask the president. You've, had, you've met with me and confer, and if we could afford, if we don't do the part-time faculty and staff, what, what is your thought about the base? 
Uh, so my my recommendation would be to add uh, one percent to the base in this budget cycle. Uh, since you have already added the one percent to the property tax to take care of the removal of the tu tuition um, challenge, uh, uh, we did not add that into the budget at the front end of it because doing so would re require us to draw from fund balance uh, for a, uh, an amount, not at the $500,000 last year, but I wanted that to be a very upfront conversation with the board. We would then remove that again from the budget activity next year and seek to balance a budget uh, without using fund balance um, but to the extent that we have fund balance available that we could use next year for some other priority we would uh, you know possibly look at that then and I I don't uh, somewhere in here I have the math of what that would uh, cost but uh, for a one percent what I Chris do you have the number what it, so absent the part-time with the addition of the 1% and the tuition coming out, uh, the difference in what we would require to do the from a half percent to 1%. I see the total down there as um, it's $136,910 is the difference between the the half and, and the 1%. Okay. And Chris, with that additional now 2% increase that's been voted on would that cover without going into the fund balance it, it will not it will not so what would the difference be um, if we if we do a a one percent increase to the base the cost is two hundred and seventy three thousand dollars we have approximately seventeen thousand dollars additional income currently in the budget with the one percent removing excuse me removing the tuition and increasing another one percent property tax so we're short about we're six, short about 100 uh, excuse me about 260 yeah over a quarter of a million okay okay for the one for the full one percent for the full one percent okay so that would require us going into the fund balance um so i i um i'm going to respect the opinions of the trustees and leave my motion intact oh, I didn't no do the math. you did yeah, yeah. okay uh, for a half a percent because it keeps us from going into the fund balance and um, I think that's where the comfort level is if I'm reading the board correctly um, so um, it will still require going into the fund balance, but not to that less. degree yes, yeah correct. Um, so uh, I'm going to call for my motion let me ask a question before sure um, I guess I'm inclined um, um, <laughs> I'm inclined to not know what to do about this motion. <laughs> um, last year, uh, I had asked for a salary study so that we had a comprehensive look at how competitive we were. Mm -hmm. And I think I missed a meeting and we voted not to do the comprehensive study. Mm -hmm. um, and you've talked about maybe reinstituting re that. I would like to know where we're at before we start increasing the base. And I don't have any sense of that in terms of where we're at competitively. And I think that's an important ingredient in terms of making these decisions. Having said that, um, I suspect a half percent increase is not gonna m make a big difference in the long run. But um, I, I do think in the future, as we vote on these uh, base increases, that we should have a sense of where we are in the competitive world of education. I guess I base it off of CPI that, you know, is. CPI of this region, I think, is at 1.5, Chris, is that right? I, I do not have that current okay. number. I apologize. I believe that's, I guess I need to verify that. But I know it's more than a half a percent. Um, and so, and that information is readily available. We probably should have had it here tonight. Madam Chair. Yes. And it's, and it's cumulated over each year. That's a additive uh, percentage. And so, you know, you could make a case for doing much more than 1%. Yeah. without a salary study at this point. But um, we know that if we're not maintaining that or paying attention to it as we go forward, uh, we're going to be back in a position of paying catch up with our base. And where it really, where it really impacts, it, impact, it impacts us in two ways, um, somewhat at the top end. But the top end, you, you could make some uh, argument that uh, the top end of our salary scale are benefiting at the top end of the salary scale, and they've gone through the steps to get to that. Uh, spot. Uh, one of the um, 
But one of the adverse effects that we have is at the bottom end of the scale and where our entering and our starting salaries are placing employees um, uh, as um, in a competitive uh, work uh, environment. So uh, paying attention to that base becomes important in recruiting um, people to come and work at North Idaho College. And so we do have, and I think a salary study will help us be, be more certain about that, but we do know we need to do some maintenance on the base. Okay. All right. This page, yeah. Well, I'll call for my motion. All in favor? Aye. Are you in favor of the half a percent? For the half a percent? For the half a percent. Aye. 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 Are there? Page two of 25. Did you want to vote? Thanks. Page two. I will say aye. All right. Mm. So we have. We have four. Mr. Randici, did you want to weigh in? Nay. Nay. All right. Motion carries. Um, the next consideration would then be, uh, do we want to fund a salary study for next year? Uh, trustees, any motions on that? It says two of 25. I'll make a motion that we would fund a salary study uh, to begin in the fall. Would that be appropriate? We're looking, who are we looking yes, for? Mark. Yes. We begin in the fall. Um, last year we thought it would be about $40,000. Uh, the actual amount that we had, uh, and it was also coming out of fund balance, was $26,000, oh, I good. believe. But we did, that was a very conservative, was a very conservative, conservative amount. amount. We, we know we were going to need to add to that at some point. All right. So I, Chris, is 40000 a good starting point? Uh, Trustee McLennan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Karen Hubbard for a lifeline on this one. So the 45, 40 to 45 is a much better option than the 20. <coughs> okay, I'll make my motion Thank 40 you. to 45,000 for a salary study. Um, that would include adjunct. Okay. And um, so that next year when we're talking about adjunct that we're very clear of where we're at in the market. And so that's my motion. Do I have a second to my motion? Second. Second by Trustee Dunlap. Discussion? Um, Trustee Banducci, you had a question about adjunct. Now is probably a good time for that. Uh, Dr. McLennan, can you talk a little bit about our adjunct and where they are in the market? Aren't we going to vote on the, 20, the, the money for the study? Yeah, but under discussion, Todd wanted to talk about adjunct because this, this study would fund them as well. So I, I don't know that I can talk specifically to adjunct um, salaries. I don't have the the knowledge or the information about that. I think more general comment about the part-time salary increase is it's, uh, we have a board policy on step increases for full-time employees. Uh, we've never had the, the board hasn't had the discussion, does that ought to, you know, do we want to add now part-time employees uh, at all levels uh, to that automatic step increase? That's another question. When we look at part-time salaries, part of it is the variability in part-time roles, not just part-time faculty, but other part-time roles. And uh, it's, you know, it's market-driven, and it's, it's depending, on the, uh, depending on the role that you're asking uh, somebody to perform. And so there's a lot of variability. We may, we may be, have just complete adequate funds in the majority of our part-time uh, resources. We don't, we don't they're, those, those are easy to set up or down within the budgeted amount of the total part-time salary pool. So if we find that we're not able to attract a certain type of employee for something uh, at, a, at a lower salary level, part-time salary level, we can make adjustments to that without doing anything with a, an across-the-board yeah, increase. Okay. The part-time faculty rate is a, is a different issue because it is tied a little bit more towards some other things, including full-time faculty uh, participation in overload um, okay. uh, activity and, and uh, the value that's attached to that, uh, that, that work effort. Um, so, but we don't, ha I don't have any knowledge of exactly where we are in the marketplace with that. Maybe others do in the room. Uh, well, once again, I'm the guy that's been singing the song about differential for the harder to place, whether it be in the STEM or CTE or nursing, to no traction for the last several years. Last so year we gave a 2% increase, Todd, <sighs> to, to adjunct. It, 
So no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. There's no traction. No, no I'm talking about what Rick addressed. Okay. About being able to offer. Sorry, I was addressing what was said by the president, which was part of his explanation. So, that's all right. Well, um, in the motion I've made, it would cover part time faculty so we can really do a market driven study. And then when we come back here next year, I would imagine that we will have some good discussion and we have real data in front of us. Yes, but there's still the challenge of a differential to be able to be able to pay teachers differently more off the grid, if you will, literally and figuratively, for those that are specialties that are harder to fill. Normally those fall into the STEM areas of study, CTE areas of study, you know, which encompasses nursing also. So the ability to have a differential pay is still something I think that needs to be addressed, but it's, it seems to be such a threat to some that it's not something we can ever really put on the table. I, I still challenge that there are some areas of study that are easier to fill than others with instructors without compromising quality or with compromising quality. So that's we, a totally we can't seem to have that discussion, but that would still be part of yeah, we need to have that discussion separate from, from this discussion um, because it's a standalone item. But I did hear the president talk about adjusting in that's, the areas we need to. That's what I was addressing right there was the differential, so, the ability to do differential. Madam Chair? Yes. So my, <laughs> I want to be clear, my adjusting was not in the, on the issue of differential pay for faculty at any level, okay. part-time, full-time, or otherwise. That's what I thought. That's why I that, said. that is a different policy question and some institutions are dealing with that uh, in some creative ways um, and I'll tell you with not without some disruption uh, in the institutions where they've sure. they've gone in those different directions that's not what I'm talking about what I am talking about though are different part-time roles from whether it's a part-time groundskeeper to a part-time librarian to a part-time IT help desk uh, person those are roles that can be differentiated based on on the positions and, and, and the supply of uh, labor in those particular, you know, we can make adjustments with our, within our existing pool of part-time resources to be variable there, but no, I'm not suggesting any variability in the adjunct okay. faculty rate. Good clarification. I, I will say that it's been several years ago now, right before um, Trustee Dunlap was president, we did a salary study addressed specifically at part-time employees because our feeling on this campus is that we should pay a livable wage. There shouldn't be anybody, whether it's a groundskeeper, uh, or whatever area they're working in, our commitment was to a livable wage. And at that time, we knew we had had the study, we knew what a livable wage was, and so I'd like us to get back to that again, uh, make sure that we're doing that. Um, and so, again, my motion is that we fund a salary study next year in the amount of uh, probably not to exceed $45,000 and um, it would cover our part-time uh, employees as well. Do I, have, I had a second from Joe. I'm going to call for the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Point of, okay. I'm sorry, point of clarification? Yes. When you say cover part-time, you're talking about in the study? Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Trustee Banducci, did you have a vote? No. Okay. Motion carries. All right. So, anything we have more to talk about on this budget? If anybody clears, wants to dig in, I just we've passed it, but I still had wanted to make just a comment about the fees that I noticed, and maybe I can get an explanation. Some of the fees, um, they are what they are, but oh my gosh, can they be really high, especially with the helicopter people? And I assume that that's all about the vendor. Madam Chair, members of the, of the board, we're currently not offering that program live. It's on the book so that we could if we had uh, potential enrollment. But that is actual seat time in a helicopter. It covers the fuel. It covers all those aspects. So it is, it is a hefty fee, yeah. but it is in-flight training. Okay. All right. And then the, I had one other question. There was, I want to say it was uh, the mountain biking so their fee went up by about forty dollars 
because of transportation costs, but then when you looked at all the other, uh, like scuba diving or all the other little things that we do, um, their transportation costs didn't change. So why did mountain biking change for transportation costs? I'm trying to find them. They seem to be it's, the only It's on page um, there they are. seven of 10. And so I just know I thought, well, why did theirs increase in and for transportation costs, but nobody it's else? PE 110 uh, W. Okay. Um, and the fee went from three hundred and ninety-five dollars. Yes. To four something. To four eighty. It's a forty-dollar increase for that particular um, program. So, and it, it would look like it was due to transportation costs, but all of the others didn't seem to have that. So, Madam Chair, I'll have to get back to you with that. Uh, we picked an evening when Dr. Burns was not able to be here, and she would be more able to probably explain that specific fee than I am. I'm happy to provide an answer for that. Okay. Um, but there is a $40 increase in that particular course. And then just in general, the fees, of course, I, the nurses too, their fees are horrendous. but. Um, student, student, um, student loans and scholarships and all that, do they address the fees fairly well? They do cover the course fees, so they can be used to cover those expenses. Okay. All right. That's all I had. Board, any other questions on the budget? Um, we had, I don't know if Todd wanted to make a motion on his, uh, request for 2% increase on part-time employees and adjuncts. I know we've discussed it. But that's still on the uh, okay. Uh, to what end? I, I don't think there's support for it, and we're already short the money. So okay, I just want to add make more to our bill. So, and it's my understanding that there's still going to be a need for a fund balance transfer. Uh, yes, sir. Given the changes that we've uh, talked about, do you know what that amount is so we can put that in and vote on it? I have it calculated as one hundred eighty-one thousand nine hundred and ten dollars. Say that again, please. $181,910. Okay. So you think we need a motion on yeah, that? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Did you want to make that? Yeah, I, I, I would then make a motion that uh, we authorize, as part of the budget, a fund balance transfer in the amount of $181,910 for fiscal year 20. Do I have a second? Second. Um, discussion? Question. Yes. And, th and that's from the... Um, College reserve, not the capital reserve. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Madam Chair, if I could offer one yes. suggestion, a not to exceed amount, because as we calculate the final tax uh, for the one percent, there may be some variance there. We may not need the full one eighty one. Okay. So you, you want the the motion to read uh, a fund balance transfer in an amount not to exceed one hundred eighty one thousand nine hundred ten dollars? Yes, sir. Right. That's the motion. All right. Uh, and uh, second by Trustee Dunlap? No, Murray. Oh, sorry, Trustee Murray. All right, I'll call for the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Nay. Okay. Motion carries. All right, anything further on the budget? The overall budget. So we didn't do that. No, no we have to do that now. All right. Do I have a motion to approve the overall budget as amended? So moved. Do you have a second? Second. Motion is second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Nay. Motion carried. Thank, Thank you, you for all your hard work on the budget this year. It's never an easy task, but um, you do a good job of breaking down the information so that we can see all the options and make the decisions. So thank you all very much. Thank you. And I would be remiss not to mention there's a lot of people behind me who helped do that. So the team in the Office of Finance and Business, led by Sarah Garcia, want to just thank them for their hard work. Thank you. Yeah, thank always. You. Yes. Thank you all. All right. <clears throat> Takes us to new business, uh, tab three. First reading, action, revised policy 2.0104, Jessica Adams. Chairwood, trustees, President McLennan, 
colleagues and guests. Thank you for having me here to present on the proposed revised policy. Uh, this is a policy that I have spoken to you guys about throughout the year in my Senate reports. Uh, to give you a brief background um, before I answer any questions that you guys may have since it is your first reading. Uh, this uh, proposal um, all started with uh, College Senate forming an ad hoc committee to review uh, the idea of forming a committee on campus that would be working on helping policies get regularly reviewed and revised. And uh, that's where that started. We felt as though instead of creating a brand new policy, why not use one that we already have and uh, improve it from there. When we were adding it to the, this policy in front of you, we realized that a lot of questions we get from campus is about the proposal process as well, uh, not just uh, the governance process of approving the policies. So we added uh, in the proposal uh, revisions to outline who on campus can propose uh, revisions, deletions, uh, or new policies. Uh, so that's the bulk of the revisions in this policy is adding that verbiage on those across campus who can propose uh, those and then also the uh, ad hoc committee for reviewing policy and I stand for any questions. <coughs> Thank you, Jessica. Board, have you had an opportunity to look over the policy proposals? It's first reading, but do you have any comments on the proposal coming forward? Uh, I have one. Trustee Banducci. More of an observation, but I actually see the words I finally like. I, I, used, I talked about it in the executive session. I've even talked about it today, but participatory governance, that's the proper terminology. It's not shared governance. We, we have this notion and it's incorrect, but you, in paragraph one here, you actually use the terms participatory governance. That is more accurate. So glad to, to see that. <coughs> Thank you, Chair Rudd. Trustee Banderjee. Any further comments, board? All right, uh, Jessica, we will come back at second reading if we have, oh, yeah. Let's, yeah. Maybe one. Well, I, I do have a question. On the, um, the last page of the policy um, where it talks about any constituent group, and I, how do you define constituent group? Uh, so that is, uh, and it's going from page two into page three about the recognized constituent group. Uh, so constituent group on campus, sorry. Chairwood, Trustee Howard, <laughs> to respond to that. Uh, we have our constituent groups of the ASNIC representing the students, the staff assembly representing staff, faculty assembly representing faculty, and then we've got president and president's cabinet. Uh, and so we wanted to ensure that those proposals are being routed through a recognized constituent group. And it may be a group that uh, ASNIC is uh, working with uh, it may be uh, a group of staff, faculty, administration, and students that are all working together on it. Um, it's just wanting to make sure that it comes from the campus, not from an outside organization. Well, the only the question that came, kind of came to mind was uh, that's with regard to proposals to create, revise, or eliminate policy and or procedure. Uh, can, can be made by any recognized constituent group, and I think there might be a student um, club on mm -hmm. campus can, can they as a are they a recognized constituent group or maybe you ought to define constituent group in a way that holds it to those entities that you're describing because i can see any any collection of students or faculty or whatever that's not um they, they may be recognized yeah. as a, a group on campus so uh Just chair woods trustee howard did you have a well, let, go ahead, you finish that. Uh, so that was a part of our uh, discussion, um, but we would be encouraging that group, that club, uh, because we did have a group of students on campus that joined with a department uh, that then worked through ASNIC on the process of bringing it to the Senate and to the president. Uh, so yes, that's we just want to make sure that they're being guided and that uh, they're working through those constituent groups because a club is absolutely under ASNIC 
and within that constituent group body. Um, and we would be working with uh, fostering that development and encouraging them. And a part of that is because we want to make sure that they're working, if they're proposing revisions, we want to make sure that ASNIC is connecting them with the policy owner. So that club is working with the policy owner uh, on those revisions. Does that answer your question? Well, it, it's an answer. Uh, I still have difficulty with the concept of a subgroup, if you want to call them that, of ASNIC um, being recognized as a constituent group and therefore being authorized by this policy to initiate, create, or revise uh, policy. And, and I, I, I would think from your discussion that really you want it to be ASNIC as the superintending agency to be the constituent group that is proposing the change, not a subgroup. But they would be, ultimately, mm -hmm. because well, it goes through them, is what I'm understanding. But President McClendon wanted to clarify. So, uh, Trustee Chairwood, uh, uh, Trustee Howard, I think the, the point that you make about definition is just, it's a, it's a clarity point. And as we've had discussions about this, what is meant by recognized constituent group uh, comprises three groups. There could be a fourth in the future if it were a recognized constituent group, but it's ASNIC, faculty council, and staff council. So we just need to define that as what I think you're suggesting. That's right. Okay. If, if that's who really is ultimately the only one who is going to be authorized to initiate these proposals, they ought to be named then in and, definition. And then to further explain the other part of the comment, uh, uh, the policy owner, uh, we already, that's a language thing too, we're t maybe policy originator or policy um, administrator. Uh, there's the, you're not seeing procedures with this because there are a number of, uh, so how does, ultimately if one of the constituent groups uh, develops a policy idea or a revision or whatever, um, it's, still gotta ha it's still gonna have to go through Senate on its way through the governance process. So to be explicit about that process a little more in the procedure. So you're, you don't see those yet. We, we've agreed that we have work to do on those and that'll happen probably uh, throughout the fall to, to kind of uh, narrow that down. But one of the key elements of that is uh, to not have any group working through a policy without some coordinating, coordination and communication with the policy holder, constituent owner, uh, creator, whatever term that is, um, you know, that would be listed at the, you know, policy originator or author on the front so that, the, that there's coordination and communication about that work that's happening on policy review, development, whatever's happening with the policy. But we, that work is yet to happen. Okay, thank you. Trustee Banducci. Well, I was just listening to the definition of the constituencies, and to me, every individual student is a constituent since they're paying money for the services of the college. So I guess if we're going to define every subset has to, of a student subset has to all come under ASNIC, then I guess that's the umbrella, and ASNIC has to speak for all. So It's their governance process, and, and it's effective. They have a representative here. So, okay, is that, is that it? Uh, Jessica, thank you. Thank we'll you. see you at the second reading. Yeah. Thank you. So, Dr. Uh, we will we'll add a definition piece to this to make sure that it's clear. Either we'll spell it out in the actual constituent groups that are can do that, or uh -huh. we'll say a constituent <coughs> group is these entities. Okay. Trustee Banducci, I'm looking for a motion to table tab four. I make a motion to table tab four. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. We'll take that up at a later meeting. Um, tab five, first reading, action 2019-20 board meeting schedule. Dr. McClennan. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, in accordance with Idaho Code section 67-2340 through 67 dash 2345, the Board of Trustees is required to adopt an annual meeting schedule for its regular meetings. The schedule is shown in attachment A. The schedule shown in attachment A is proposed to establish the Board's annual meeting schedule for the coming year. As in the past, no Board meeting is planned for July 
Meetings are scheduled for the fourth Wednesday of each month, except as noted in the attachment. Any retreats and workshops will be announced and scheduled as needed. Okay. It's our first reading. Any questions, Dr. McClain? All right. We'll take that up at the next meeting. Uh, okay. We have an action item, and this is a resolution which we would like to honor um, our state member, board member, Don Saltman, who is um, retiring after serving, oh gosh, has it been seven years on the state as our state board representative? I have it in the resolution. Um, anyway, we want to properly thank uh, Don as we go to the state board meeting in June. And we'd like to do that with a proclamation from our trustees. So what this is tonight is the proclamation. You've all had a chance to look at it. Um, we'd like the approval to present Don with this proclamation and thank him for his years of service uh, to Idahoans. Madam Chair, if it's That's okay enough. with you, I just like, I'd like to make the motion to the following procl proclamation, but read the proclamation. Please do. All right, so I'd like to move uh, that the board adopt the following proclamation from the I North Idaho College Board of Trustees. That whereas the North Idaho College Board of Trustees in its capacity as a governing body for an institution of higher education in the state of Idaho, wishes to honor Mr. Don Saltman for his service to the citizens of North Idaho as a member of the Idaho State Board of Education, whereas Mr. Saltman has served the Idaho State Board of Education for 10 years, including two terms as president and terms as vice president and secretary. And whereas Mr. Saltman's <laughs> leadership on the Idaho State Board of Education helped to guide the board as it considered public education policies and provided for the overall governance of public elementary, secondary, and higher education. And whereas Mr. Saltman has served the Idaho State Board of Education in 2013 when the board was instrumental in the implementation of the governor's task force for improving K-12 education, and whereas Mr. Saltman has volunteered countless hours of service on various committees and work groups in support of improving public education in Idaho. The University of Idaho Presidential Search Committee in 2013 and 2018-19, and on the Governor's Higher Task Force in 2017. Whereas Mr. Saltman's years of dedicated commitment to public education includes service on the North Idaho College Strategic Planning Committee, 13 years of service on the Lakeland School District Board of Trustees, four years of service on the state's Professional Standards Commission for teacher certification, and service on the state committee that developed the graduation standards in science for Idaho students. It is therefore resolved that the North Idaho College Board of Trustees honors Mr. Don Saltman for his dedicated service to the citizens of North Idaho as a member of the Idaho State Board of Education and his tireless efforts in the pursuit of educational excellence in the state of Idaho. That's my motion. Great. All right. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Could I discuss real quick? Uh, after you second. Is, okay. Second. All right. Discussion? Uh, yes. Don Solman has a pet peeve with saying North Idaho, not Northern Idaho. And it might be valuable to put in Northern Idaho at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Northern so, Idaho College? No, no. Where it says, uh, <laughs> where did it say it? Uh, citizens of North Idaho as a member of the Idaho State Board of Education. Second to last line. Yeah. I would re recommend changing that to Northern Idaho. Second to the last line. So that's one change. Okay. I'm Don okay would be impressed. Well, well, only you would know that. Yes, I would. <laughs> oh, and there's one at the top also. Yes. So if that's a, if that's a motion to amend to say Northern rather than North, I accept that. Okay. <laughs> I need a second. Second. You can't second your own motion. <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't mine. I'll second. Okay. All right. I have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We're happy to do this, and I'd like to thank Shannon for her work on this. Um, she does such a nice job on these proclamations. You want me to talk? Yes, please. Yes, please explain what will happen at the state board meeting. So our, our, our tentative plan at this point, uh, and when, you, when Trustee Wood says when we go to the uh, state board meeting. The state board meeting is here, uh, so we're hosting it in June. 
Uh, the evening, uh, the first day of the board meeting, that Wednesday evening, uh, some institutions, it's handled differently. Sometimes there's a dinner. Uh, what we're going to be doing is a heavy uh, hors d'oeuvre reception, outdoor reception, weather permitting. And it would be at that reception where we would, we would recognize and invite others to help us recognize uh, Don and, and present this uh, resolution to him at, at that event. And we'll do everything we can to get him to attend. So <laughs> I think he has to. It's his last meeting. Yeah. So good. All right. Very nice. Thanks for your work on that. Uh, that takes us to our board chair report. What I wanted to update the board on was uh, a meeting that Chris and I attended uh, with the city council. It was actually general services committee. And then last night I attended the city council meeting. Chris and I attended because the council is in process of um, trying to go out to bid on the grandstand project at Memorial Field. And as you know, our softball team uses the, the Memorial Field every year. And so we had a vested interest in that remodel and what they were doing. Uh, a year ago, over a year ago, we did uh, commit $150,000 to the remodel. We are about one-sixth of that project. Uh, Ignite Coeur d'Alene, the Urban Renewal Funding, is paying uh, $1.2 million for that overall remodel. But what had happened is when it, when it didn't go out to bid last year, in this economy, everything's going up, and we've all been in these shoes where construction costs are rising, and all of a sudden, you can't get your bids within the budget. And so they were over budget by a significant amount, about $400,000. So the city really had to do some, um, I guess, deciding on how they were going to pursue this. Um, Chris and I went to the general services uh, meeting and expressed to them that we, um, we really want to see the project still move forward. There was some concern that they just wouldn't do the project at all um, because of the budget overruns. And we um, offered thoughts on how they might do that if they needed to phase in the second portion of the project, which would be the NIC uh, locker rooms and the restrooms that put it in next year's budget that we think that that would probably be workable. Now, they were happy to hear that. They've been um, very considerate to us, con considering we're only one-sixth of the project. They've, they've seeked out our input constantly on this. Of, would it be okay if we tried to do this in next year budget? They're not going to walk away from the project. They're committed to it. And so um, we thought it was appropriate to make some concessions. Uh, one thing that has changed through that process, um, everything was going to be put under the old grandstands. There was going to be the locker rooms and the restrooms and a concession facility built on there. But it is incredibly expensive to go under, what did they call, I think they called it into the jungle under that building, um, and try to do something new with an old structure. So um, they had a thought. The restroom across, right across the street in the city park is an old facility that they had in mind for destruction and build over again anyway. So what they have proposed and what they approved last night at the council meeting was they will demolish that restroom in the park, they will build a new one, and on that facility they will build locker rooms just for NIC. We will be the only ones using it. There'll be a locker room for male and female. When we're not using it, it will be locked. It won't be available to anyone else. And so I think that they have made some significant um, concessions for us. And honestly, that facility serves more people being in the park than right there under the grandstands. So it seemed like a great workable solution. And they approved that in their budget last night. So that's for your information. Also, they talked about the cardinal on the building. They always give me a hard time about that. Sometimes they say it's going to be this big, and I say it's going to be this big. And so um, there will be a cardinal on that building. And so that's still ongoing discussion, but it'll happen. Do we get a cardinal on the locker room also? On the locker room door, yeah. Yeah, they've committed to that. But we want the big cardinal that was the floor of the basketball court um, that's still available. Al's tracked that down for us, and so we're still working on that. Um, any questions on that? Um, Madam Chair, um, I'm going to sound awful cynical when I say this, but um, 
to move forward with the expectation that from now on ever, forever, uh, that locker room will be devoted only to NIC and uh, athletics um, is something that I just don't believe will occur. Um, I think we ought to get something in writing if that's the promise. Um, that that's going to be something that NIC can lock up and retain and, and, and have access to because I envision that at time will um, bring forward other um, requests to use that area and the city will accede to that because they'll own it. So uh, I'd like to find some way if that's really what the promises moving forward that we have some something in writing that that's NIC's facility to use. Well, I can talk to the parks director about that. I'm not sure how that will be received. They did make a verbal commitment, but I'll certainly talk to them about that. Well, I, I just remember going through the documentation on the dock, when, or the, excuse me, the, the dike, when we were taking down the trees and looking at all the documentation and everything, they still said it was our responsibility when it wasn't. So we have differences with the city from time to time, and I'd just like to see something in writing to memorialize our understanding. So what, um, in that particular instance, uh, Trustee Dunlap did some very good negotiations for us, and we came out very well. <laughs> so, but um, I will carry forward your idea in a discussion format. Thank you. Uh, any remarks for the good of the order? Trustee Banducci. Um, I was privileged to attend a couple of things here recently. One was the uh, GED, AB, Adult Basic Education, ABE, GED graduation. We had a, quite a number of people walk. Uh, Schuler Basel was quite full. And once again, they've done a great job and a great event. Um, the second was uh, the nurses pinning uh, for the RNs. We just produced 30 more nurses to take care of all of us as we're aging. So uh, I'm encouraged by that. It was quite a, uh, quite a group. Uh, Sounded like they just had done a fantastic job in the program. So a couple of other graduations. And then, of course, we had the dual enrollment breakfast. And how exciting was that? I mean, my gosh, we had over 100 kids, if I understood that right, that graduated from high school and college simultaneously. And, and, and the sort of the irony there is they actually walked at our graduation commencement before they're able to graduate from high school. And we have to wait till we actually get their transcripts so we can formally confer their degree upon them. Um, because of how the rules work, unless you're a homeschooler and you walked in the ABE GED and maybe you got your high school there. So, it yeah. so they were, might have been ahead of the game in that. But anyway, some really exciting things that happened. And I uh, encourage people, to, uh, any of those uh, graduations or events, if you can make it, it's, it those, are the one, those are the good things to come to. Those are the fun ones. They were, I totally agree. Graduation was wonderful this year. Great, and I loved your speech. I loved did great. your speech. I really enjoyed graduation. And there was this really handsome red-haired boy that came across the stage. And his grandfather <laughs> cut in front of me. <laughs> he, moved, he moved pretty quick for an old guy, he didn't did. he? He said, I'm giving out this diploma. But that would be really fun to do. So That was a go. treat. Yeah. I, yeah. So anyway, all right. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. We're adjourned. Thank you. I know I do.